first of all, welcome everybody. Welcome uh, as we, we welcome poetry for the new year. We're celebrating Chinese New Year. I should say we will be celebrating Chinese New Year in two days, so September 1st, welcoming the Year of the Tiger. So my name is Bruno, and I work at the Dr. Sun and Classical Chinese Garden. It's also very important to mention that, that we are sitting in the traditional territories of the Slavotu, Squamish, and Muslim nations. And it's really a privilege for us to be working here and working collaboratively as we learn and grow together and respecting and understanding each other. Uh, so today we have a roster of amazing poets who have decided so kindly and generously to join us. Uh, we have Fiona Flam, we have James Wang, we have Jay Yun Yo, we have Lucy Yang, Isabella Wang, and Catherine Lewis. We will begin with Fiona Lam, and then I will be introducing each poet. Each poet will read two poems, maybe one or two more, if we're lucky enough. Uh, and at the end, as I've mentioned, uh, we will host some, some space for uh, discussion, uh, questions, and sharing platform too. Uh, the event we are hopefully will last 60 minutes. It can last a little bit longer, depends on our availability. Uh, so welcome everybody and, and I hope you enjoy. So thank you very, very much. And I would like, first of all, to introduce Fiona Lam. So Fiona is Vancouver's sixth poet laureate and has published three collections of poetry in the children's book. Her award-winning poetry videos produced in collaboration with animators and filmmakers have screened worldwide. Fiona was listed for the City of Vancouver Book Prize and other awards, and her work is included in over 40 anthologies. Uh, also, Fiona is a very dear friend and supporter of the garden. It's never enough to mention how generous and, and amazing Fiona is to work with. So thank you, Fiona, and we're here to hear you. Thanks so much, Bruno. And it's so lovely to see and know that you're all out there listening on this um, auspicious day. It's gonna be um, Lunar New Year Eve tomorrow and then uh, Lunar New Year's of course on February 1st. Lunar New Year is celebrated by very many cultures all over the world, uh, not only diasporic communities, of course, but in Taiwan, in Korea, in Vietnam, um, of course, mainland China and Hong Kong and other places as well. And um, many, many, many communities all around. And they're celebrating even though it's been a very, very challenging time. Um, I was sad that this is another year without a Chinese New Year parade. The parade of course goes through Vancouver's Chinatown with 3,000 different participants and over 50,000 people as spectators, usually. The last one in, I think it was in 220. So we didn't have one last year or this year, but I have a lot of wonderful memories of being uh, in Chinatown, um, eating my steaming buns to keep warm and trying to uh, put my very heavy sun on my shoulders to see things as they pass by and the, the treats that would be handed out and the um, the lion dances and the dragon dancers and so forth. But one thing that we still do and that I will be doing this evening and tomorrow evening is making dumplings. And that's something that we did every year on Chinese New Year Eve or Lunar New Year's Eve. And my mom was actually not a great cook. Um, she didn't fill the stereotypes of uh, what uh, Chinese uh, women or Asian women were supposed to do. She was a doctor, like we have some doctors who will be reading uh, today um, poetry, but my mother was a doctor and she was a single mom with three kids and we ate a lot of frozen food and convenience foods and discounted convenience foods to boot um, when she was resuming her practice after a long year of um, many years of being uh, not allowed to work. When my father passed away when I was 11, um, my mother had to return to work and quickly refresh herself and take care of the family. And I tried to help as best I could, um, making my shake and bake and uh, Lipton onion soup and a hamburger helper and so forth. But we would have takeout Chinese food, but we'd also 
once a year have homemade Chinese food. And this is a poem or prose poem about that. New Year's Eve. Once a year, our mother dragged out the old Chinese cookbook with the cracked covers. We'd wash down the table with hot tea while she shoved hunks of cabbage through the grinder. When the white shreds were heaped in the blue bowl, she'd add minced meat, splash and spoon in the seasonings, blending them all with bare hands. Into another bowl, she'd scoop flour, pour water, mix them and start massaging the paste into muscle. She'd tear off a wad, knead it down to a disc, roll it in flour, then crank it through the machine. Side by side, my sister and I would start cutting circles out of the long skin of dough, gathering the scraps to re-roll, re-cut, tossing a few lumps for our little brother to play with. At table's end, my mother would stuff the circles with filling, crimping the edges. When the rows packed the trays, she'd move to the stove, to the bubbling pot, the pan spitting oil to boil and fry. We'd wash up. Soon she'd fish out the steaming pillows of dough and slide out the crisp ones glistening from skillet to plate where they'd be devoured as fast as they landed. Each hot morsel dipped in sauce, barely chewed, swallowed. Then the second batch, throat to belly, the slightly slower third. Sated at last, we'd surrender, dazed at what we'd waited months for, real food, what came from her hands. So we sure like dumplings, but they sure go down fast, too fast actually. And I don't know if any of you out in the audience uh, eat uh, pot sticker dumplings or um, the Korean version of them um, or the Tibetan version of them. There are many versions of these delicious, delicious dumplings. So another poem I'm going to read is from uh, my book, Odes and Laments. My books tend to have, I was realizing as I was going through them that I have a lot of food poems. Uh, I guess they, they inspire me. Well, this poem is about generations and it's not about dumplings, it's about rice. Curve upon curve, terraces ripple a valley with sheens of green, silver, gray, rhythmic scenes undulating as if land were wave. Rice, for us, came from Chinatown. Rice came from stores. Rice came in burlap sacks, hauled and tossed into the car trunk like sandbags, lugged upstairs to the kitchen, sheared open to release the cascade of white grains into a bin under the counter. Then scooped triple rinse steamed in our ancient rice cooker with its rattling lid. The clicked switch signaled dinner. Steaming domes pillowed our bowls, mingled with stir fry and stew, replenished again and again until the cooker was scraped to the bottom. My father's urgent quests through England, America, brushing past potatoes, bread, pasta, to hunt down Spartan cafes tucked in rundown blocks. He'd relish each mouthful as if haunted by ancestral hungers. Weeks without, my cravings start, and now my son's, as if nothing else can quell the yearning of his cells, each lustrous mound, a homecoming. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Fiona. That was food for the soul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so our next poet is uh, Catherine Lewis. I will be spotlighting right now. So, okay, so Catherine, Catherine Lewis is a Vancouver-based Chinese-Canadian writer, and her debut poetry chapbook, Zipless, was published last fall. A graduate from the Writer's Studio at SFU, she was a finalist in the 2021 Creative Nonfiction Contest hosted by the Creative Nonfiction Collective Society, the Humber Literary Review, and the fiddlehead. So thank you very much for joining us, Catherine. And I will leave it up to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Fabulous. Um, I'm so very honored to have the opportunity to read for you today among such a talented lineup. 
Huge thanks to Fiona, who was one of my very first creative writing instructors for the invitation. And a big thank you to the garden for hosting us. I have one poem for you today. It is titled Golden. A few times a year, like at Chinese New Year, by our suburban kitchen table's temporary altar of incense, by the trays of oranges and lucky candies cobbled together the night before. Or like at my birthday, okay, definitely at my birthday, or always at Christmas, under our tinseled up tree with the paper decorations I made in my Scarborough kitchen. Red envelopes arrived for my sister and me on each of these occasions with fresh banknotes from each grandma, from each married aunt or uncle, a matched pair unfailingly shows up from mom and dad. These envelopes sometimes pre-printed with wishes for prosperity in a language our parents have to translate for us all our lives. In recent years, mom and dads arrive bearing only their surname emblazoned in gold. One single Chinese character pre-printed in crisp, shiny, thick golden text. Sharp contrast from heavy red paper that's sometimes shiny, sometimes matte, sometimes bearing a different font from the last. I don't need to ask mom whether she got them custom made. I just know. I just know that wherever she bought them, that there are walls and walls and walls of envelopes pre-printed with the limited set of Chinese surnames in existence. The complete list of Chinese surnames is short. The list of Western surnames is long. For year after year during my second decade of marriage to someone not Chinese, the red envelopes my wasp husband and I give out at Christmas or Chinese New Year or on birthdays do not carry a Chinese surname. They are generic red envelopes my white husband and I got for free at the mall or at the bank or with the London Drugs corporate logo. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Still, there are nothing like the red envelopes my sister hands out with only her married Chinese surname in crisp golden text. I hadn't realized this would be a consequence of me marrying white. I asked, mom, what am I supposed to do? I'm not that excited about giving out the generic envelopes anymore. I have gotten sick of using the few Hello Kitty ones I could find. Mom says, well, we could get some custom made for you. In Hong Kong, two days before my cousin pours tea for us at his wedding, mom leads our family through an underground mini malls corridor to a tiny glass walled shop with wall after wall after wall of the few hundred most common Chinese surnames pre-printed on red, orange, yellow envelopes in clear plastic boxes spiraling, spiraling all the way up to the ceiling. My sister and her husband tell the shopkeeper their Chinese surname before the man plucks out box after box. There is, of course, a whole section for them. Some envelopes in red, some in yellow, all of them emblazoned with golden text in half a, in a wide selection of different fonts, half a dozen different choices for my sister and her husband. My tall, bespectacled wasp husband and I sit down with the shopkeeper, flip through his catalog of sample envelopes write down our custom golden text. The shopkeeper mocks it up in Microsoft Word, printing out a black and white prototype he affixes to the same dark red matte envelopes my parents have. We prepay the deposit for pickup. So in a few business days, I can finally start living the life I always meant to have. Everyone, thank you so much for your kind attention. It's been such an honor to read for you all. Thank you again to Fiona and to the team at the Garden. Uh, that, was, that was wonderful. That was wonderful, Kathleen. Thank you very much for sharing. The next poet is uh, Isabella Wang. So Isabella has authored the chapbook on forgetting a language in her debut poetry book, Pedal Swing. Her work has appeared in over 30 literary journals and three anthologies. She's completing a double major in English and world literature at SFU and is an editor at The Room Magazine. 
So thank you very much for joining us, Isabella. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be gathered with everyone here. Um, yeah, I. it's been a few years since I've actually been able to even celebrate um, Chinese New Year with anyone. So it's really nice to be gathered with all of you guys here. Um, I'm going to read a new um, sequence of short poems I'm working um, for a manuscript. And this is the first passage. It um, kind of celebrates the friendship of um, that's written about in um, Ai Weiwei's book and memoir that's about his father who was a poet during the Chinese Cultural Revolution and who was given a really hard time and kind of prosecuted for that. Um, and his father, Ai Qing, was a poet and his collection of um, poetry is translated in this book. And I think the poem uh, responds and kind of celebrates some of those friendships. And it also kind of acknowledges, I think, a kind of sadder baseline of just this time that kind of has been kind of blurred with sorrow and loss and also kind of spiritual healing when grief goes to such an extent that, you know, it becomes kind of spiritual. And this is the first passage. It begins with an epigraph our great land that was dead, now under the bright sky, is reborn again. It's by Ai Qing in his poem, Reborn Land. Xinzuo, constellations, are ageless stars reborn as, sorry, Xinzuo, constellations, are ageless suns reborn as stars in the seats of a conversation. They can neither ferry nor pine for a different steridian arrangement, but keep talking. Their expositions depend on the peoples of lands and revolutions, seeing them, imagining the bright sky, deep futures of their holding illuminations until they're gone. Mornings, how are their heavens? Is there urgency for us to join the departed still? The skylarks shepherd nimbus dunes over sixth snow, and the blue that dawns before dark's xylem leaves its edges with a lake wood and memoir of the some pianissimo furs. Is there a thing as crying in havens, a rival forgiving the tin earth tarts, their ghosting of the whistling stratosphere, forgiving them a night? to remember the tender orbiting of another year's late growth and picking up conifers of firs by the side of the body's capering road. Water misses three weeks, filling in six years of winter leanings absence. It took time for three movements and old Chinese proverbs to gather connected threads. Mom barrels of leaves, stipule and veins, laddering tight mycelial growth, raking because river constellations rove over the sweater of the man wheeling his chair. Li Yuran and Ai Qing met in the beyondry of firs, like France, island, a paper clips, miniature warrens, dividing cylinder folds out of two pages and the precipitation of this life. They met before meeting again in heaven because of snuck medicine, friendship fielding the incarcerated under revolutions, tuberculosis and cornbread equals industrial train dust. Some can no longer divide themselves into halves to be the poet's split leaf propositions. So we bow them with ghost arms into piles. For a while, chestnut leaves whole with others again. Propositions. I could erase your and with a soft dinosaur eraser 
and tell you in return that the two halves of what you think of fires and floods are just feelings, the weather expressing its newfound poems collaged, resport of light that remains unmade, flows out of the poets who fainted on stage in New York Buffalo. Climate scarves and piano keys drum against the pharynx of those with no language to lose, form more intense friendships, love constellating. It makes sense that through extinction's pulse, there are end species, atmospheric cyan and rivers all want to live the slower climbing weeks of perhaps their last couple of months. Only the color blue would not go extinct because it was the last pigment we spent perfecting and its seeable cellular duplications of grief has become Mia Adernay's novella. The last swordfish in water's nostalgia burns, evolving into a monster, but survives the rainbow stripes of gasoline riding the roof of her home and catching little fires like three fishermen and their dog planked to the bottom of the boat for 16 hours as one steered the northwest axis of the rudder and the others slept unsuspecting. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's, it's hard to it was it was beautiful Isabella thank you so very much for sharing that uh, the next author I will be also spotlighting is is James so um, James Wong is a Chinese Canadian poet and physician who began writing in earnest in 2019 his work has appeared or is forthcoming in Ark and the Fiddlehead he belongs to the poetry group Arbor Center 5, which will be publishing a collective chapbook, Brian, in 2022. So thank you for joining us, James. Thank you so much for having us, Bruno, and thank you, Fiona, for, for giving us the opportunity um, to really celebrate together. Uh, I know it's been a, a hard time um, most recently, but also over the past year and a half um, and I'm so glad we are all able to come together in this um, extended family of poetry lovers. Um, so I, I'll share two poems with you guys. Um, both are celebratory in nature. Um, the first poem I like to share is titled How to Make Grandchildren the Old Fashioned Way. And this is a fun and light poem in the style of a recipe with an Asian twist. And I feel like recipe poems are the kind of poems that um, every poet has written at some point. Uh, so this is mine, and I hope you enjoy. How to make grandchildren the old fashioned way. Preheat oven with kindling. Throw in incense to hush ancestors. Flick open lunar almanac. This recipe demands precision. Try to remember last night. Was the moon full or not? Fetch gourd from garden patio. Fill with wishes from a silver river. Pour three cups for boys, four for girls. Boil until overflowing, then simmer. Pick and trim virtuous greens. Discard skins, stems, and stringy bits. Rinse off regrets until ready to proudly mix in large bowl. Finally chop fresh lemongrass that your mother loved across the sea. Add tablespoon of red dust from your father's village road. Sprinkle fennel seeds for intrigue, pinch of cassia for complexion. Season to taste with opulence, shape into unbroken braid. Bake until bloated and golden, offer first bite to gods of the home. Okay, thank you. Um, and the second poem um, I'd like to share um, is one that was just recently published a few weeks ago in the Fiddlehead Literary Magazine uh, in the BIPOC issue, um, and it's titled Fossils. And although this isn't a poem about Lunar New Year, 
Um, it has many of the same themes about family, childhood wonder, and a celebration of Asian culture and language. So here it is, fossils. I ran my fingers like whispers over brass plaques, round and square to fit sandstone consonants. Igneous vowels are smoother, diphthongs an oiled slide. Sorolophus Edmontosaurus Shantangosaurus. I wonder if Wade and Giles were ever territorial, carnivore cuspids clacking on ossified spicules, their dual scrunched into stratum. Albertosaurus, Gorgosaurus, Tyrannosaurus. Huashi, grandma said, means transformed into stone. She pointed, don't you think this one wears last night's star anise on its back? Stegosaurus, Hoyangosaurus, Chunkingosaurus. I sometimes hear her weathered calcium creaking when the earth's fissures confess where they have been. Gallimimus, Ornithomimus, Avis. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Lovely. Thank you very much. Delicious recipes. Yes. Amazing things. Thank you very, very much. The next uh, poet is Lucy Yang. Uh, so Lucy is a teacher and writer based in Vancouver, BC. She loves to explore language and literature with her students as well as mentor each career teacher. She writes to examine intercultural pedagogy and feminist diasporic identities. Her work has appeared in the forthcoming in various education and literary journals. Thank you so much for joining us, Lucy. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Um, so excited to be here with everybody uh, reading poetry today. Um, thanks, Fiona, for organizing um, this opportunity for all of us to be able to celebrate the new year. Um, I have two pieces today um, inspired by my experience growing up both in China as well as a northern town in BC. The first piece is called January. I remember the snow melting on my face, us pushing the shopping cart up the hill. I remember the cars slowing next to us, faces peering out. You want a ride? I remember father pale in the cold, waving and smiling and shaking his head. I remember the wheels spinning and stopping every few steps, then a fierce heave. I remember the cart left aside and the bags mother carried because I was growing. I remember the key rattling, the no-name soda and the no-name chips. I remember the noodles the three of us slurped that evening, gingery and warm. The next piece um, is called Lunar Birthday. Mother gave birth the day before the new year. The horse's tail grandfather tells me every winter with a shiny red pocket. It's unlucky for girls to be sheep, older brother says, chewing a strip of spiced jerky. Lucky you got here early. Aunt shoes him away, handing me glazed hawthorn, tangy sweet orbs on a bamboo stick. I munch, eyeing dough twists, dipped in sesame, melon seeds, baked and salted, preserved dates soaked in sugar. Come, little horse, grandmother looks over, fingers knotted in red thread. Hang this over the door, opportunity. I sit on uncle's shoulders giggling. We march to the kitchen, smelling pork and chives. Father chortles, tossing noodles and rolling wraps. Mother clicks her tongue, chopsticks flashing. Later that night, I clap in time as everyone sings. Outside, the bangs of the first firecrackers begin. 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Lucy. That was amazing. Thank you for sharing those memories. It's like we were there. It's very, very beautiful. The next and final um, poet is Ji Yun Yo. Thank you very much for joining us. So Ji Yun is a Korean Canadian poet and psychiatrist whose works have been published in the Thames Review, Prairie Fire, Brain, Contemporary Verse 2, Event, and Rice Paper. She's currently a student at the Writers Studio at SFU, and she's a member of the Poetry Collective Arbor Center 5. Thank you for joining us, Julian. Thank you so much um, for hosting Bruno, the gardens, and also Fiona. I'm already feeling so inspired by all the wonderful uh, readings. So I have two poems to share with you all today. The first poem is called Welcome Home. Um, I grew up in Korea and Lunar New Year was something that we celebrated every year and there was a real big emphasis on honoring ancestors. So we would have these rituals of making these delicious food and then we would offer it to our deceased ancestors and they would get first dibs and we would eat the leftovers, so to speak. So those experiences really inspired this poem. Welcome home. We left the door open so they can float in like painted kites. Stay with us. Count the children's rice puff toes, tickle liver spots on grandmother's cheeks, snuggle up against our sleeping backs. Stay with us. Here we are quiet breaths beneath quilts, the moon a pale thumbprint on the window. Stay with us. Just until breakfast, egg battered pollock, dried jujubes, peeled pears, soju for the soul. Just a bit more. Stay with us. Imbued with sandalwood incense, the grass graves are fragrant. Great auntie and grandfather ghosts return from their lunar pilgrimage. And the second poem I have is called Stargazing. This is a love poem because I feel like in any culture, any tradition, love is really there, like it's everywhere. So I just wanted to honor that and celebrate that with everybody here. Stargazing. We drive at dusk to Porto Cove, stand at the edge of the big bowl, brimming with moon jellies and silver green fish. Look up at the great bear's light from thousand years ago. Look up at the time traveling tail star of the swan. I look left at the crescent dimple on your stubbled cheek, the same smile your ye, ye once had in a grainy photograph. You look right at my black hair, windswept like calligraphy of my pensive ancestors. When we are long gone, back to being water and salts, the night sky will be a flower bed, constellations bright as baby's breath. We'll look down at centuries ago, see how we steered our eyes away from Cassiopeia and instead kissed. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much again. Pleasure to the senses was just, just so beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm very happy to also check that we have some time. So as we end all the poetry reading, we will now begin a small sharing session. I will ask Fiona to lead this sharing session. It will last for about 10 to 15 minutes, but please again, make sure you use the chat room. You can use also the raise my hand feature in case you do want to unmute yourself and share. Uh, and thank you all very much. Thanks so much, Bruno. And thanks so much for the gardens hosting this event. Um, it's so wonderful to be able to celebrate with poetry and with such talented 
very, very talented emerging writers. Uh, and they're very different voices, different styles, different content, but beautifully shaped work. Um, I thought I'd start off by asking each of you in turn, um, maybe Catherine, you can start about how to start a poem. We've got some poets in the audience, nascent poets. I can spot you out there. Some of you have written many poems already and published. Some of you are emerging poets and emerging writers. But the big question is how to, be, especially for the new year, how do we begin? How did you begin your piece about the red envelopes? Um, as for that piece, I actually, uh, most of my uh, great majority of my writing is stream of consciousness. Uh, and so I don't think I've even touched the first line, but I remember thinking, I really want to start this off with mentioning uh, the Lunar New Year. And I did add in, um, only afterwards did I remember to add in more specific uh, imagery about my family's celebrations of the Lunar New Year. But the fact is, one of the things about starting off a poem is that we frequently write into a poem. I recently attended an event where uh, a workshop event where um, we talked about how a lot of the writing at the start of a poem, it might be stanzas that can be chopped off later. So yeah. I did cut some details from the beginning of this one. Um, just wanted to clarify. Sure. And it's great because it's very vivid because I could see that room with those stacks, that walls of, of red envelopes right there it was a great image. And um, and even for all the poets and writers out there, if you do chop and trim and so forth, you can save and recycle, upcycle those uh, those trimmings for later. So don't throw them away, whatever you do. Thanks, Catherine. And Isabella, you had a wonderful epigraph as well. Can you talk about the start of your poem and how you generated that poem? Yeah, um, that one is kind, that one, it's, it was a new, I think, new voice for me, like a new kind of chapter in like just my poetry. Um, I think, I think part of it was I think just, well, like you ask how do poems start and with these ones, like, like it's like just crying because like since November 11th, when like we lost like Lee Miracle and Phyllis Webb and um, and then later Atul Anand, like there hasn't been a day I has, haven't cried. And like, I haven't, and I've like, and I haven't cried much in like the past eight years. Um, so it was just, I think a new voice for me for poetry at a time when I kind of just entered a new stage in my life and I wasn't really, I didn't really know how to um, process a lot. And it, these poems came to me at a time when I really thought I was, I, I was never gonna write again and I couldn't write again just because of the grief but I ended up writing tons just because um, I had a lot of close friends, I guess, who was um, also mourning. And so poetry became like these kind of, you know, individual little envelopes of and emails that I would send them kind of as gifts and comfort. And one of the, I guess, biggest overlapping um, things among all of these poems is the fact that they respond either to an individual person or to like a poet and so that's how I seen came it was written with my prof Stephen Collis and we have been reading um, Ai Weiwei's book together and so yeah that's great well uh, every poem every lyric bit of prose is a teacher and reading about Ai Wei, this, his life, his father's life, his father's poems, those are stacks of teachers, uh, each one. Um, and the voice is, is beyond time. So sometimes when we're feeling stuck, definitely going to a book of poetry, reading a passage over again can inspire us, can infuse us with um, lyric energy. Thanks, Isabella. And Jimmy, two terrific, very different poems. One with that lovely form um, of the recipe and 
Uh, I've seen that form inspire um, prose as well as, as poetry, and it's a lot of fun and entertaining, and people understand that structure. They might not understand a villanelle or a sonnet, but they'll understand a recipe. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that, and then even and with the dinosaur poem, it's a lovely list poem, right? Using the list of dinosaurs. Can you talk about that use of structure? Absolutely. I think I really like incorporating form into my poetry and um, I've tried different things from, from our time together, Fiona, and, and afterwards like experimenting with um, different types of form, uh, like pantoums and, uh, and so on, and, and moving things around, um, line breaks and stanza breaks, those are things that uh, um, I pay a lot of attention to. Um, and I think for the recipe poem, um, it was something new, it was fun, it was light, and it was um, meant to um, be widely accessible to um, people who, who may not um, read the very dense poetry that sometimes um, some people might find um, inaccessible. And I wanted it to share not just the images, but also the emotions uh, that we have when we're going through cooking, because in, in every culture, transcending cultures, cooking is, is something that brings people together, right? And I, and I think whenever we're exploring new cultures, um, food is something we, we often gravitate to. So that was the, what, the inspiration for that poem. Um, and then for the, the list-like poem with fossils, that was inspired by um, a childhood trip to Drumheller, seeing the dinosaurs in the museum um, and uh, learning that a lot of uh, the work in science and paleontology um, is not just North American based. You can look at the scientific names for a lot of different creatures and, and they come from all over the world. And uh, I was really inspired that there were a lot of um, uh, Asian scientists, Chinese scientists who lent their names um, and places of their birth or places of their discovery um, to the names of uh, the dinosaurs. Uh, so it was a nice blend. Yes. Well, I have to see that in print and see some footnotes about the scientists' names and so forth. Yeah, I mean, we live in a world where everything is flowing and interrelating and integrating and, and so forth. So yeah, yeah, uh, very good job. Thank you. So we're moving on to um, Jayan's poems. Um, can you talk about the lyricism and how did you work with images that were embedded in your memory and, and tried to distill them? Or how did your poems begin? Yeah, I think that's a really good question that makes me reflect. And I think actually, typically, when I start writing, I actually start with an emotion. And then it, the emotion is usually linked to a memory. And then I really try to go into the sensory details of what did that memory look like? What stays with me after all these years? And then it's easier to add a specific image and riff off of that. Um, sometimes when I'm stuck, I end up actually spending a lot of time Google, like looking at Google images and trying to get inspiration from that. Um, but I think for these two poems, um, the Welcome Home, because I had such vivid experiences of that Lunar New Year tradition, um, the memories and the images came to me a bit more naturally. And then the stargazing poem actually uh, James, so Jimmy and I are a couple and we did go to Porto Cove uh, one day and that was, you know, that was also like a very, very lovely memory for me with the stars. So that's how it influenced my writing. That's great. And I uh, inadvertently went to JN before Lucy. Lucy, of course, what I loved about your pieces is, is about the sense of place. Can you talk about how that influenced your writing? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think what June was saying about the emotion piece, for me, it's place. Um, and I think of, you know, everything I remember about, um, you know, a particular, you know, street or um, a room in my grandmother's house, something like that. And then I just sort of go off and do um, sort of stream of conscious uh, writing and getting down all the details. And, and then it just sort of comes from there and then you go through and you, you know, like you were saying upcycle or recycle or you, you, you know, prune and, and just sort of comes about. Um, the first piece, 
um, actually came from one of the poetry courses um, I took at SFU, um, not the one that I took with you, Fiona. Um, another one where it was an exercise of using anaphora, which is uh, repetition. You repeat the beginning of um, the, the first words of you know, a stanza or a line or something. And then um, our prompt was, I remember. And, um, and yeah, it just sort of came from that. And the second piece, um, again, it was mostly a description of, I, I was thinking of the space. I was thinking of the living room of my paternal grandfather's house and thinking about how everyone would gather around the, around the couch and what we would be doing. And um, of course I would supplement um, what I forget. Um, so the details of what we, what we had eaten, I would go on Google images and find, you know, what are the auspicious things to eat <laughs> during, um, you know, Lunar New Year, and then it'll come back, right? It'll come back. Yes, we have those dates. We have those, um, the candied hawthorn, which is my favorite. <laughs> Candied hawthorn. What is candied hawthorn like? Can you tell everyone? Uh, for sure. So I recently actually found some in the uh, frozen aisle of um, certain uh, Asian grocery stores. Um, so it's a stick. It's sort of like a kebab of um, hawthorn fruit. And the hawthorn has been glazed in uh, hard sugar. And so it's a combination of... Um, like a very sweet treat, but also it's uh, quite tart. So it's, and then it's crunchy, but then it's also chewy. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> we all want to get some now. That's great. Thank you, Lucy. So I'm going to ask the audience if anybody has a feast food that they think would be the great um, seed for a poem. If you have a favorite feast food that you, whether it's the turkey or it's the stuffing or the gravy or it's something else, a feast food doesn't have to be Asian. It could be Asian. Um, please feel free to put it in the chat. And uh, oh, salmon, yes, lucky red salmon. And it can be pink salmon too, of course. Um, food can be a great source of inspiration. And as Lucy did with place, oysters, yep. Um, and once you even hold an object or the even the, hold the memory of that place or that object, that food, and brainstorm about the sensory inputs, the memories, the faces, the dialogue. You have the start of a story or a poem or a play. So yes, food foods from all cultures. Uh, tamales, yes, yum, kanji. Kanji, I'll, I'll, I'll email you, Isabella. <laughs> takes a long time. If you put a pinch of baking soda, it really helps break down the rice. <laughs> for any else, anybody else have kanji tips? But um, um, yes, Instapot is excellent because it gives the pressure cooker and breaks down the rice. There should be a recipe poem about making kanji and the content. Some, the Northern kanji is a plain broth and you add things to it to give flavor. And then the Cantonese style kanji is made with stock and has flavor already in, in the kanji. Um, but uh, yeah, salted donuts are great, yep. East African um, um, bananas with every meal. That sounds terrific. Excellent. Now, any questions um, from the audience for our terrific poets here? Any questions at all about writing or public jujubes? Yes. I would love to see a jujube poem. David, I commission a, a jujube poem from you. <laughs> No questions at all. Is anyone gonna do anything special for the new year? I need to clean up my, you don't see it right now because I pushed all my piles up to the front outside of the camera reach, but that's what I'm gonna be doing is uh, cleaning my office so I can actually find uh, all my notes and so forth. Yep, Ellen's been cleaning. Anybody else got any rituals? Anybody going to see a line dance or see the lantern festival that's outside the Vancouver Art Gallery? Well, there are lots of other events that are going to be going on. Maybe Bruno, if you could come back on and tell us about what's going on at the uh, the gardens. But Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. I actually have a question. Um, it could sure. even be for you, Fiona, as you're uh, asking questions to everybody. So does 
right, while writing poem, poems and poetry, because most of them, they're quite emotional, whether it's bringing memories or just telling a story, does the inside, does, does your heart, your own emotion play always with what you're writing? So does it mean that you have to be sad to write sad things or you can be extremely happy and still be able to write sad things? I think you can write any time. Um, when there's a, a wonderful uh, local black poet who wrote about poems starting out like a, po a pebble in your shoe. And uh, I think if there's something that's going, huh, I could be a poem, I could be a poem. I think you have to respond to it right then. Don't shake out the pebble, stay with the pebble, write out whatever the idea is, the image is, uh, whether you're feeling happy or sad or very uncomfortable um, or uneasy. Um, and you don't have to be sad to write a sad poem or happy to write a happy poem. In fact, it might be interesting if you had a different kind of emotion. I think just put it on the page and see where it takes you. Like a, it's got its own journey. Um, Leticia was mentioning she was uh, making eight treasures rice cake. Maybe eight treasures rice cake might be a really sad thing because you remember someone who made it when they, that isn't around anymore. Or maybe it's a happy experience because it was a very festive thing that you shared. Either way, you could still write about it, happy or sad or in between, or maybe a mixture of both. Just like any recipe, it's a mixture of many different ingredients, memories, feelings, sensations, research, uh, what other people have written. Hope that answers your question, Bruno. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not a writer, but I, I, I think I don't know, just more, more about the emotions. I just went through all kinds of emotions listening to all six of you. So for me, it was just very, very, it, it was a beautiful moment. So that's why I was very curious about what's your state of mind when you're writing something. It could be very happy or very sad, but what's, what's the state of mind, what's going on and how you find inspiration to write about something that personal sometimes. James had a quick question about what come, why do poems come at 1 a.m.? It's because it's quiet. And uh, you're settling, all the things are sort of sifting down and the little poem is going, hey, what about me? That's a great time and you have to write it down. You have to turn on the light and write it down. We, we did have lots of beautiful comments. I, I'm, I won't be able to read all of them, but I, I, think, I think the overarching theme was that everyone had an amazing time and all, everyone was very thankful for all of your tips, all of your insight, all of your talent, most of all, and, and for being able and to share it with us and so generous of all of you. It just, was just an absolute pleasure. And as I was mentioning at the beginning, I, I'm, I'm really hopeful we can do something like this in person, like a, a full poetry day here at, at the Dr. Sonia Sin Garden. That would be lovely. So I will be pushing for that. And as, just, just to get a little bit of uh, of, of what Fiona was mentioning regarding our, our activities. If you are around Vancouver or thinking about coming uh, here at the garden, we'll have mostly activities connected to, to Lunar New Year uh, over the next weekend. So both Saturday and Sunday, there's a whole program of activities. I will be sharing that as well when I send a recording of this, of this talk. We invite you all to come. It's a by donation event. Nobody is gonna be turned away due to lack of funding. It's pay what you can want to celebrate with the community. This is a celebration for the community. And uh, I, I want to thank you all for, for joining us and the many, many more events like this. If you have any questions that may arise after we finish, just I believe you do have my email, just email them. I will do my best to share the questions with all of the poets or answer the question myself in case it's, it's a question directed to the garden. And I, I, I want to wish everyone a happy new year and lots of joy, happiness, smiles, love, and poetry. Thank you so much, Bruno. And thanks to our fantastic poets. You were great. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. It's Thank lovely you, to share poems with you. Happy new year. Happy new year. Thank you so much.